Okay, so maybe first things first, um, it'd be cool just to talk about you know the experience of today. I mean, is this is your first time meeting each other, as yes. far as I understand it? Yeah. Amazing. So, so how did you hear about the project? And you know, well, it's funny. Evidently, Evo sent me a an email, but I get a lot of emails because I have a small label, so it kind of got lost in the spam. And then I got another one at my school email because I teach at Cal Arts. So I got one there, and he says, "Did you get my email?" And I said, no. And he said, uh, and he outlined this thing, what he wanted to do. And I said, so you want to record with me? He said, yes. I said, but I live in Los Angeles. He says, are you going to come out here? It's a lot easier. I have all my horns out here because I, I have a pretty wide array of instruments. Plus, I deal with gongs, I play a lot of gongs and singing bowls and those things. And he said, no, you come to New York. I said, okay. Uh, it's expensive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that thing. So we covered all that stuff. Then it was down to like what instruments. And first, I was playing a uh, baritone because I, I have horns on the East Coast for when I tour, so I have a nice set here that I can use and just bring like a bass clarinet or if I have to bring clarinets or something like that. You know, something more portable, soprano. So I have Soprano here. Yeah, I have a Soprano here, too. So whatever. And he said, uh, these are the people playing. He said, uh, I want you to play. Um, originally, he wanted uh, just clarinet. And I said, okay, that's great. So then he called me back a little later, and he said, uh, uh, after a couple of days, he said, well, what about alto clarinet? And I said, alto clarinet's cool. I said, it's nice. I said, the bass horn's a little bit more unusual. He said, oh, it's a great idea. Bring the best one. Then he said, can you play bass saxophone? And I said, I can play the bass saxophone, but I don't have one, you know, you'll have to transfer. So anyway, we worked out all the logistics, and then we just met in the Uber. Wow. wow. And uh, that, but I, you know, I mean, you, you do your research, you know, you go to, I mean, nowadays it's a lot easier than it used to be. It used to be, like you said, go and buy a bunch of records and listen to everybody and spend some money and buy CDs and see what they did. Now you can go to YouTube, you know, you can go online, you can hear pretty much p people's whole history, you know. And so I said, well, okay, this will be fun. And, and I had heard about Evo from, um, we both recorded for Simp back in the day uh, with Barb Roosh and, uh, and stuff, but on separate projects. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had seen his his, re his recording, and uh, I think I don't have it at home, you know, but CDs now, everything's in storage, you know, because I um, just moved. So anyway, that's the story. It's like I did some research saying, oh, this will be fun, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I wound up like he wanted to do something with the entire saxophone family and all the ones that I had were pretty much already taken. Um, I didn't bring. I didn't mention the F mezzo soprano or something like that, which would take. I couldn't bring the basso horn in and another two carry ons, so I wound up playing the smallest one that I could think of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'd love to ask you more about that. I'm, I'm sorry, forgive me if I'm wrong, but it's Soprillo. Is what Soprillo, it's yeah. Okay, that's. I, I, I mean, I would imagine that. A lot of people are like me and have never even seen that one before. Well, there are a lot of them it. because it's it's um, uh, it's in an extremely small high range, and it's an octave above the soprano. So most people don't even like the sopranino, and then this is higher than that. So you know, you know, I mean, dogs love it, but um, but um, I have a saxophone uh, group, uh, five saxophones, and I did this project called Music for Like Instruments, where I put all the E-flat saxophones together, so from contrabass to sopranino. And for the B-flat ones, I really wanted a higher soprano voice, and, and this had just been invented by a maker in Germany called Benedict Eppelsheim. And so uh, I went, I was in Europe, and I contacted him, and I already owned a, a tubax, which is the contrabass saxophone he makes. And he said, yeah, he said, I'm going to be in Paris. Are you going to be in Paris? I said, yes, I am going to be in Paris. I was doing a production of, uh, I wrote music for uh, 
King Lear. And um, um, the theater was playing in France. I went, we met. He lent me one for a while, and then I bought the first one that he, one of the first ones he made here. Deep, deep. Yeah, but it's just kind of a rare thing, and it's very tight and very, like even soft reeds feel hard. It's very, it's a very concentrated thing. If you play a lot of soprano and a lot of sopranino, then moving over to it's not so bad, but if you play tenor or something like that, it's like getting your mouth really tight like mm -hmm. that sometimes is difficult. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, I'd love for you to speak a little more, uh, maybe maybe just from that perspective, just just about today's experience, you know, mm -hmm. and, and especially even just, you know, if you could talk even, uh, you know, for sure about the Suprilla, but, but even maybe the experience of switching between these horns and, you know, if you felt like that changed the aesthetic of the music at all, mm -hmm. your approach and so on and so forth. Well, I, I started as a, a, a visual artist. I started as a painter, similar to... Evil, with, we have that similar background with visual art. And um, I think of all oh, the horns as like a color palette. So depending on where he's going to go, I have a palette that can cover not exactly the low lows, but like kind of low, uh, you know, not compared to like contrabass clarinet or something like, or contrabassoon or something like that. But, but I can go... A little below him gives me some room and then i can also because this the best one has an incredible range um, um i can go as high as he can go and then i have the ability certainly on the clarinet and on the soprillo to play in those higher ranges mm -hmm. and then when he's doing that more soft kind of more spread that almost old school tenor saxophone which everyone we all love that, that big ass tone. Then I can use some of these other instruments, not the soprano, <laughs> but to create a bed where he can lay the tone on top of. So I think of it in a very non. In some ways, it's non-musical. It's more visual. Hmm. Uh, I just see the shapes and the colors and and stuff. And of course, every once in a while, my inner brain kicks in and talks to me about lines and scales and stuff so I have to kind of push that out and mm -hmm. just kind of open and be open about like what's happening here and then what I can add and 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 sometimes it's by not playing you know mm -hmm. that kind of thing yeah man I, I you know and, and this might be just more for me than anything else but I'm, I'm just very interested in your perspective on on, on that kind of just way of thinking in particular um mm. you know you were talking about how you know you did your research before you got here and you're talking about all these different like color palettes like specifically related to the horns and evo and so on and so on and yet you know so, so there's sort of all of this like preconceived things going on you know and yet all this music is happening in the moment mm -hmm. you know like how to balance those two things you know i'd love to hear you well I, I don't think with this music you can not to contradict you, but I, I don't think that you can preconceive it because the sounds are pretty much the vocabulary of each player. For example, like I play a lot with Ken Filiano. Ken Filiano's bass knowledge is quite fantastically large, and he has the ability to do the things he talks about. So when he's playing with the bow, I'm thinking automatically I'm in a kind of semi new music classical mode and I'm playing an instrument that might do that when he switches more to the pitch and playing like more in a straight ahead thing then I might switch to a different saxophone to do that kind of more linear fluidity thing the one thing I noticed is that that the two approaches like when you're dealing with it from a more classical quote unquote you know contemporary classical or whatever you want to call the music now I mean, there's so many terms, it doesn't matter, you know. But um, um, when you're doing that, you know, that puts you in that kind of mode where you're more an orchestral player. When you're in a jazz situation, that puts you in a mode where you're playing much more linear. And so, you know, you, you pull that information up. So it's like you have all this. And it's up to you to stay as open as possible to something that may happen that you didn't intend to happen also. 
you know, a finger might slip or the multiphonic doesn't always come out, you know, some things like that. Then what do you do? You can make it sound really bad by trying to force it, or you can give what the instrument gives you. Mm -hmm. And in this, in this case, the instrument gives you quite a bit. So if you're fluid enough with your technical ability, then you can adjust to that. You know, it's not like playing so much tunes in a cycle where you're kind of like planning out that kind of structure. It's much more you're like playing, you know, in, in that setting is much more architectural mm. in, in a way. This is like more of a, of a sculptural where you could add, add, you could take away and then and reveal what, 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 what the end piece is. Beautiful. I, I love that. Giving what the, what the horn gives you. Mm. Yvonne, I don't know if you have anything that you want to ask about today before I move yeah, on to I, the other Yeah, I feel like you. It's amazing. We do have the background in arts and mm -hmm. we think alike. Mm -hmm. This is incredible. Mm -hmm. you said. Um, my question to you, Vinny, is um, for, for me, first meetings are unforgettable. I like to meet a guy and, and go and play. I, there's nothing that I hate more than being in a comfort zone. Mm. I'd like to be on my toes and be surprised um, I like to play with people I never played, I never heard. Uh, do you think today um, was our meeting, quite honestly, mm -hmm. you don't have to be dishonest, mm -hmm. do you think we, we hit the magic uh, sphere of first-time encounters that was um, uh, a mixture of, of surprise, amazement, l the ludic, the playful, mm -hmm. the cerebral, do you think my my uh, experience in first meetings was reflected today in our first meeting? Mm -hmm. How did you feel about that? Well, how do you feel about mm -hmm. first meetings in general? Well, first meetings are always interesting because you have to suss out the other person's vocabulary if you don't know that person. It's one thing to hear it on a record, but then you, you, you're recording of some sort. But the thing about recordings is they cover one hour of your entire life they, they mean they're only guideposts and like little posts where you can anchor it's like when you rock climb you need to put like when you really rock climb like i don't do that anymore but um when you go you like looking here here's a handhold then you feel and you get another handhold and then you, you go and you kind of figure out your pathway to do that so to answer you I can't f fathom it at the moment because it's been very concentrated. Because we meet and we're in the studio, and then we're making uh, something that's going to last for a long time, and you want to be the best. So I'm, most of my attention is like li is focused on listening to you, and and interacting and and trying to support, and doing the things in the music. But I think, like, just in terms of listening back, we hit a lot of spots. You know, I mean, we didn't only heard, like, you know, 10 seconds, you know. But 10 seconds of three pieces showed me that, like, oh, so that's working. That works. Maybe this, I could do this. You know, that, that kind of thing. So I'm reassessing. So I think it's pretty successful for the most part. Uh, um, uh, and we'll probably you have like this level we already hit like a certain level and we won't go below that so that's excellent and we'll just get it it'll just work out to be better as long as we both continue to work on our stuff and so everything should be fine Good. yeah beautiful yeah